Welcome to the Tuesday, September 11th, 2018 School Board Regular Business Meeting. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. introduce our new student representatives. Thank you for being here. We have Julia Thorak and Piper Strunk, both juniors or? Yes. yes. Great. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Nope. Uh, may I have a motion for approval of school board minutes? I move we approve the school board minutes for the special business meeting Tuesday, August 28th, 2018. We have a second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. All right. Next, we have comments from our new student representatives. Um, so we just have a couple of things today since we just completed our first week. Um, one thing is that throughout the whole past week, as advisors, we've been talking about. Um, uh, like instances if there were, or what we're supposed to do if there's an ever happens to be an intruder in the school because um, there's been some updates to that and so we now each classroom even has um, a special device for the doors to um, that you can put in to make sure that no one can come in from the outside of the doors so that it like keeps the doors from opening um, and now each student also knows what to do, um, where to go, and like if um, how to like make judgments um, if there happens to ever be an intruder. So. And also, um, this past week we've done a lot with um, a thing called Upper Links, which is kind of like a mentor program for the upperclassmen to try to touch base with an underclassman and make sure the transfer from middle school to high school is nice and smooth. And this year I think was really successful. I was at Upper Link and was able to really connect with my um, underlink and I think that if this program like continues, it's a really great thing. And we're gonna continue on this program throughout the rest of the year, ensuring that they feel comfortable and safe in high school. Can you describe what you do or how you what you might do yeah. in the future? Yeah, so um, what we do on the first day of school, um, because they come in early, they come in at 7.55 instead of the 11 o'clock when the rest of the school comes in. So we just um, walk them around the school, make sure they know where their classes are, make sure they know who their teachers are, if they have any questions for us. And then throughout the year, we'll just touch base, email with them, see if they have any questions or concerns, need any help on anything in terms of studying, things like that. Um, tomorrow we're doing a cookie ticket, so we're giving each of them um, a free cookie from the lunchroom. So we have to pass those out tomorrow. And I think later on in the year we're going to do like an ice cream social type thing for the freshmen at lunch. So it's just trying to make them feel included and they, they know their way in high school. That's great. I'm yeah. sure they appreciate it. I think they do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, moving on, are there any comments from the public on agenda items? Then we will move on to administrative reports. Um, 5A, our principals. Good evening. It's great to be back. It's good to see everyone. And welcome to new student representatives. Um, so I'll be as brief as I can. There's a lot I'd love to share, but I'll just share a few things that um, have been happening at Pond Cove over the past few weeks. So we've, we've had a really great start. Um, there's, there's, I think, a good vibe and a positive energy throughout the building. I think that's increasing every day. 
and uh, it was great to see the staff come together on the first opening day on the first building base day on October 28th. Uh, we did a lot of trainings, mandatory trainings, logistics, but we also did uh, some activities around um, a book called Eight Habits of the Heart. And so I just, it's a really good quick read. Um, I know our beach days are over, but um, <laughs> this, you could read this in one, in one sitting, really. Um, it's it's uh, written by Clifton Talbert, and um, it, in the book he really emphasizes um, habits that members of healthy and strong communities exhibit. And I think that we had, we had a good time um, with the staff doing some activities around this. And I think that staff felt it was relevant to the work that we're doing this year. Um, also, it's, it's, we're rolling out several new initiatives. And I wanted just to talk about a couple. Um, so all of our teachers now are trained in uh, the responsive classroom community building approach. And um, if it's an easy, responsive classroom is an easy um, program to Google and learn about, uh, but we're really proud. It's a four day intense training and our teachers K through four now have been trained in that and their strategy, they learned a lot of strategies they use in the classroom to build community. Uh, so we're proud of that. We're, we're also rolling out our school-wide positive behavior intervention and supports um, program called Peaceful Pond Cove. And that's, it's really exciting. So we've rolled that out to staff and students. Just it, Peaceful Pond Cove is, it's part of our ongoing work to foster, foster positive behavior and, um, and the teaching of social skills, social and emotional skills. And so, just a couple of bullets on that. So already at Pond Cove, uh, we've developed common expectations in all the common areas. So hallway, playground, cafeteria, restroom, all students have been taught those expectations by their teachers already. We've also worked closely with Pat Fowler and the bus drivers and we have taught all students bus safety expectations and so I thank Pat and the drivers for that. Um, so we also have, so we teach the expectations. We have um, a systematic approach to recognizing positive behavior um, in our school, which is really exciting and we, we're just rolling that out. And we are developing plans for students when they need extra support, if they're struggling with social emotional skills. So finally, uh, the last thing, um, we are excited next week we are um, beginning our volunteer program and so we reached out with, with the help with John Holdridge's help um, and I was actually going to ask him to come up just in and share just for a minute um, about some of the work that he's done this is our first um, big project that we worked on together and um, so the volunteers, the first phase of this is we're starting with a team of volunteers who will support our cafeteria, supervision of students, and um, support our recycling, composting um, program. So John, would you mind coming up just, just for a minute? So just to talk a little bit about the process you went through. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I promised I would keep it quick. Welcome. Nice to see you guys. Um, so yeah, we, we did a, I'm, I really like projects and I like when somebody asks me to be on the team with them, so it's been fun to work with Jason to meet the need with volunteers. We put out a call through different ways. I think Jason sent out an email to parents at Pond Cove with a Google form to, to sign up to meet the need of uh, lunchroom volunteers. We've had a, a much better response than I expected. Um, we've asked people to sign up for three hour shifts on one day a week. Um, we've divided in the year into roughly three month segments, thinking that a person could maybe, maybe commit to three hours one day, day a week for three months, and then you know they can re-up if they really love it, but otherwise we'll get some others. Uh, so the first segment will start on, on Monday and run till the end of November. Um, on, uh, just to make sure that all of our volunteers who are doing this work are have all their boxes checked for the volunteer protocol, I'm gonna do a special lunchroom volunteer orientation beginning from, uh, starting at 11, running till 11.30, and then Jason, 
is going to meet with them and talk about their specific expectations for that. So we've got 13, actually 14 people signed up and scheduled. We're shooting for four for each day. Uh, you know, that'll sometimes be wishy-washy depending on people's schedules, but I think for the most part we'll have be able to maintain three or if not four on every day for at least for these first three months and I would imagine that we'll be able to do that for the year. What's that? Yeah. I had heard um, from some parents that were interested in participating, but the three-hour window felt like a, a bigger chunk of time than they yeah. were able to commit to. Um, are you opening it up to smaller chunks, or is the three-hour really what We actually works? intentionally made it as, as three hours, because originally um, Jason sent me a schedule that had all of the very micro, you know, you're in for 20 minutes and you're out, and that tends to be really chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, trying to manage a volunteer coming in for 20 minutes and then leaving. We had uh, the, you know, the fear that because we're also eventually looking for some people to volunteer on recess. So my idea was that if people can commit, they would, it would be easier on both sides of the equation, bus, both our side managing volunteers as well as volunteers coming in to see if we could just get people for three hour chunks. And so far that hasn't seemed to be a problem. Um, and so I think for now we're not going to, to change that. We're looking for a, a longer commitment. My experience with, with volunteers in our schools, but also talking with other volunteer coordinators at schools and organizations, is, is it seemed to be a more significant assignment that you're signing up for. And sometimes with more significant things, there's a lot more, a lot more buy-in to it, I think. So for now, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, John and Jason. This is very exciting, and I'm, I'm really proud that our parents are stepping up, too. I'm very grateful. Yeah, we're excited, too. That's all I have, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I need, my, I need these things now. <laughs> when I can find them, I use them. Um, so, at the middle school, we're pretty excited with the way the year started off. We kind of we have some changes to our schedule to kind of increase academic time and, and, and we kind of streamline some things. Um, for our kids, I think it's nothing new. For teachers, they're, they're bought in and, and are really going forward with that. A couple of initiatives, um, A, our buildings look great and I was in all summer so you could kind of see it coming together but I'm like, there is no way this is gonna be ready for school. There were boxes and cabinets and shelves and, and somehow it just, it, it comes together. So, so the maintenance crews and the custodian crews are just incredible when you really think about the amount of work they pull off in the summer. So, so kudos to them. It really allows us to have an opening to school that is kind of stress-free. Um, great new doors at the end of the fifth grade wing and a lot of upgrades happen that people notice and it makes them you know, feel better about working and, and kids about going to school, I think. Um, it's just this time of year kills me. It's like it should be called forms time of year. So, you know, we have picture forms and schedule forms and lunch forms and insurance forms and laptop forms, health forms. The new um, immunization form where kids, <laughs> if, they, if it wasn't completed, they were not going to come to school. On Saturday night before school start, before that Tuesday, our school nurse called me. He's like, there's 59 kids. There's 59. We can't keep 59 kids out of school. So she, on her own, kept calling. And on Sunday, it was down to 11. And Monday it was five, and by Tuesday it was nine. So um, it, persistence pays off, is, is kind of what I told her. Um, but we're fortunate to have people that take such pride in that. Um, the athletic forms, on top of all those forms, um, schedule change forms. So there's, this, there's a form for everything, and nothing's important until it's crucial. So then we, all, we get them all. Uh, some really interesting new programs that we have this year. Uh, we have developed a social-emotional classroom. Uh, and it's up and off the ground and running really well. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting to see when provided the right amount of supports, how successful all students can be. And that's, that's an ongoing, I think it's gonna develop in, into hopefully one of the leading programs in the area. That's our goal is, is to not just provide a program, but develop a great program. We also have a school counseling and social work curriculum this year that has grown a lot. And I think where students will get around 30 guidance school counselor, social worker lessons this year, whereas in the past it was around 10. Uh, so to me, that's pretty empowering of their curriculum and the work and how important we value it. And then lastly, uh, I'm excited, a little bit nervous. The Thompson family um, has joined in with CEIF to provide a grant to the district for some mental health awareness type activities. 
We being the big, big picture people we are, decided it should be a year long thing and kick off this Friday. And now we realize, wow, that's really fast. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen between now and Friday. Uh, but really quickly, Jill Young has kind of, again, spearheaded this for us. Um, and it's really a year long focus on personal and mental health and wellness. And it's kind of the tagline is you will be found at CEMS. And some, the four goals are to empower students, staff, and parents to be proactive, confident, and caring for themselves and others. So to build those kind of skills in everyone. Uh, the second goal is to provide tools and tips for improving mental health. Third goal is to introduce health resources in or near our school community. And the last one is to decrease the stigmas around mental health. So it's, it's, an, it's an exciting initiative. And on Thursday night, we have a kickoff for a parent night with a panel that keeps growing. I think it must be up around 12 or 13 people now because we have some high school people that it has meant a lot to and they've reached out to us, some kids saying, hey, can I serve on that panel? So to me, when we can start to make those links from building to building and kids in the high school actually care about what's going on below them, it means a lot to me. Uh, so that's going to be Thursday night. Friday is one day of a lot of activity. We have paired, we have No Stigmas, a group we're partnering with to deliver um, this message or to kick it off with our kids. They're coming Monday for a whole school assembly. I know we're going to do some breakout groups, but it's also combined with picture day. So we're trying to build a schedule that, that we can manage and limit the, the disruptions on other days. So whenever possible, we're going to kind of team those things up. So there's a lot happening at the middle school right now. Seems like it's all coming really quickly, but uh, I hope to see you guys there on Thursday. It's in the library at the middle school. Thanks. Thank you, Troy. So um, I, I've decided that I'm going to embellish on what Julia talked about um, in terms of the focus at the beginning of the year on emergency preparedness. And it may sound like an odd thing to begin with, but I think um, what we found is that our students want to talk about it and feel better about having an outlet to talk about it and having a sense of what the plan is. Um, I do want to say sort of tangentially two things first, and one is, um, <laughs> Officer Galvin is now a steady presence at the, at the front entrance of the school every day, wishing kids welcome and, and giving them high fives and sharing, asking them questions and that sort of thing. So I think he's been extraordinarily well received. He still spends time at the middle school in Bond Cove as well. I just wanted to also share an anecdote which I found very touching that Nate Carpenter shared with me just before I left today, which was at the end of the day, he said for the last two days, there have been two young men who have just on their own in the cafeteria stood up and started stacking chairs to help out Randy Gill, our lunchtime custodian. I thought that was really kind of cool. Um, it says a lot about, I think it was two senior boys, actually. So um, nobody asked them to do it. They just started to stack chairs with Randy, which is really cool. So, um, so we spent considerable time the first three days of school um, after the chaos day of the Tuesday after Labor Day. But the next three days, each one of the advisory periods was focused with sharing with students where we are in terms of um, what if there were a violent intruder at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and this is work that is, this was sort of an outgrowth of really conversations that started almost two years ago now. And there have been some significant changes. I will say that we framed our conversations with kids essentially helping them to understand that statistically speaking, and I put this in a letter to parents, statistically speaking, <coughs> um, kids are safer in any public high school in America, including Cape Elizabeth High School, than they are if they're out driving in a Route 77 or Old Ocean House Road or riding a bike anywhere. Statistically, they're safer. Um, but there are violent intruders that have been coming to schools, and schools like Cape Elizabeth are no exception. We are not a bubble, we are not immune. Um, and so we wanted to do a better job of being prepared. So working with uh, some folks from the police department, uh, the superintendent last year, all the building administrators, fire department, and other folks, there's been a considerable shift in philosophy, and I think Nate presented um, last year uh, about sort of what the plans are. So day one of our work with students, um, students were introduced to the general concepts of what the shift is, which is, 
the, the way Nate explains it, based on the training he's had, is that the traditional way that we respond in schools is something that was based, came out of the 1970s when drive-by shootings were a real problem in schools in America. So the best response to that is to, is to close the doors, turn off the lights, and huddle low away from windows and away from doors. And that beautiful response to that, but that's not the threat that people are facing typically now. So now, what all across America, based on best advice from a lot of people who study these issues, is to take a more active approach um, to try to get people out of harm's way if, based on the inf best information we can get them, it's, it's, it's wise to do that. So we've talked to students and to teachers about <coughs> sometimes the wisest thing, if you know that there, if, if God forbid there were a violent intruder and a distant part of the school on the first floor, um, advisory groups, teachers and classrooms can probably make the judgment to leave. Um, and we've given them various points, some various exit points, uh, exit places, destinations for them to go to. Or if there's an intruder that's close by, then sometimes not just locking the door, which any teacher can do right now just by pushing a button, the butt which is on the inside of the door, um, they, they can not just do that, but take some more active responses. And the first one, and this is all credit to Nate Carpenter, the assistant principal, and Aiden Hubbs, who's a senior, um, and Jim Ray, who sort of worked collaboratively together to invent this device. This is what Julia was referring to. So these are available now, along with a two by four in every classroom in the high school. And students have practiced, and advisors have practiced sort of sweeping this under the door before they close it, putting the, and closing the door, pushing the button, and having a two by four as well. It gives an extra layer of security. Um, the locks work well, but it's just an extra layer, because what all the security people who've studied incidents across America say is, you know, people who typically come into schools to do violence are not trained people they don't necessarily have specific targets in mind, and to the extent you can slow them down, they won't pass by. That's sort of the theory. So that's what we've been practicing. So day one is just sort of introducing that concept, the overall picture. Day two uh, was students actually practiced barricading the rooms, um, and I think they enjoyed that. I think there was a lighthearted feel to it, but also a seriousness to it, and that was really by intent. Um, and day three was, Nate had prepared some scenarios that he had earlier shared with the staff, and what if this was the information you had, what would you do? What would be the most logical response, and what would be, you know, some other different scenarios? A couple of advisory groups, I, I happen to have an advisory group, and I heard Ben Raymond, as he was, was one of the teachers in the high school, as he was coming in, he was talking about taking his kids out to, so they could actually physically see one of the, one of the locations we've told them they could gather at. And he had the brilliant idea, because it was on the way, Cumberland Farms was on the way to this location. So he said, we're gonna have a lockdown special. So he brought his advisory groups to, the, to Cumberland Farms on the way and treated his kids to the lockdown special of a snack um, <laughs> as they went there. So I followed him, so my advisory group was just behind Ben Raymond's group. So, so again, it's done in a way to try to make it not, to, to, to try to open up the lines of communication, give kids and staff a sense of control. This has actually been more of a shift for the staff. Honestly, it was a little harder than, than for kids, but also to give them an outlet and, and, and but to keep it as, yeah, this is serious, and we're taking it seriously, and we've given a lot of thought to it, but we can build relationships through it as well. And walk to Cumberland Farms, or Town Hall, or something like that. So that's my report. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeff. And please tell Nate, we appreciate it very much. And tell Jim Ray, I appreciate him bringing in my son to help. It's yep. really cool. Yep. yep, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be Director of Special Services, our new director, <laughs> Del PV. Welcome. Hello. Um, I, being the first time I'm addressing the board, I wanted to thank the board, Dr. Wolfram, and of course the hiring committee uh, for giving me this opportunity to serve both the parents and students of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I just have a few things to share with you folks today. Um, 
I want to mention that all of our special education positions are currently filled with the exception of one ed tech three position at the middle school and the full-time psychologist position. Uh, and I mention this because um, the significance of this is that many of our, many of the other districts in the state are um, starting the year off uh, with the empty <coughs> positions. And uh, it's um, wonderful that CAPE has a great reputation and is able to attract the, the folks that it does. And uh, I've only been on the job for less than three weeks, but uh, probably the, the biggest thing that I've come to realize is that we have wonderful resources here at CAPE for our students and extensive resources. Um, I did want to mention we just hired Dr. Beverly Strock on a contracted basis uh, to help complete the psychological evaluations across the district. Um, I also wanted to mention that special education is under review this year or audit from the state and so we'll be going through the process of meeting the criteria that they're asking for. It includes a self-evaluation, a certain number of files will be reviewed, and they'll be making a visit as well in March. I think they're set up, they're set up to come to Cape on March 12th. Um, I want to mention that currently we're servicing 155 students in special ed. At Pond Cove, we're servicing 53. At the middle school, 51, and at the high school, 51. Uh, we have uh, 24 students currently in referral and we have two students that are outplaced out of district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're glad you're here. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Kathy, you're next. Good evening, everyone. So we've been in school for a week, and teachers have been focused on acclimating students to their classrooms and routines, et cetera. But we have our first professional development Wednesday, next Wednesday, the 19th, and I thought I would fill you in on what the teachers are going to be doing. You know that students dismiss an hour before the end of the regular school day, and then teachers stay for an hour beyond that, so we get two hours of solid work time, which is much appreciated um, by, by the staff. So at Pond Cove, last year, teachers spent um, a couple of PD Wednesdays looking at the next generation science standards and beginning the process of aligning their curriculum to that. Um, and you will see that reflected on the report cards that are issued in January and June. Um, most of the uh, classroom teachers worked this summer on developing scope and sequences in science aligned to their curriculum. Um, aligned to the standards that, that they're going to be implementing. And, um, and on the 19th, they're going to review those um, and also unpack um, some kits that we purchased for them to help them implement. Because in some cases, teachers were having to completely change what they had done in the past, and so we did have to invest in some curriculum materials. So our, um, these, these kits are STEM scopes, which is a highly rated um, science curriculum, and um, teachers are using that in combination with um, an online program called Mystery Science that's been very successful um, and has been used by some teachers here and there, and then also some teacher-generated materials. Um, but that will be the focus of, of, um, of the work at Pond Cove. And then at the middle school, um, our teachers are going to be reporting this year um, to learning targets. So they're going to be setting their grade books up by learning goals for students rather than by type of assessment, which is the more typical model. So you have your test category and your project category and your uh, essay category, and this time, um, this year we're going to be having we're going to be organizing the grade books by the by the learning targets, um, so that we can give students more specific information about what their strengths um, and areas for challenge are as learners. So rather than saying, "Well, I'm good at essays, but not so good at projects," they'll be able to say, well, "I'm really strong at reading, and I need to work on writing. I'm really strong at fractions, but I need to work on measurement and volume." Um, so that's a big shift for the, for the teachers, just in terms of how they um, organize their assessments and how they organize Power Teacher Pro, and so they will be working on that next Wednesday. And then at the high school, 
Um, the teacher is going to be looking at SAT data from the last few years, um, just trying to surface um, some some trends and um, and talk about reasons why um, we might be going up in certain areas and and down in in others. That would be the work at the high school. Any questions? Thank you again for giving us that time. It's really much appreciated. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. We have Catherine Mesmer, business manager. Hello, everybody. Hello. I'm not usually in the past. I haven't stood up here on a monthly basis, but I'm going to start now. Last June was my first time. So um, I wanted to speak about our monthly financials and also about the um, uh, accounts payable check register that I always bring for you guys to sign. It isn't required to have all of your signatures. Um, other districts have finance committees that are like a subcommittee of the school board, and so those members are normally the ones that sign. Here, the finance committee is the entire board, so that doesn't quite change the situation at all. So I just want to put before you what you would prefer. If you prefer to have a subset of members just review and sign the weekly check registers, or if you'd like to continue to have it done here at um, the board meetings, I'll bring it to you twice a month or when you meet for you to sign. Just putting it out there for you to kind of think about it and let me know what you would prefer to do. So we can move on from there. Now I'm going to talk about the financials. Um, they have changed a little bit since previous years. The cover page is, ha is still the same. It still shows the 11 categories that are required by statute. But if you, when you turn the page, instead of being perpendicular now, it is sideways. It's actually a little easier to re read. The numbers are a little bigger. Um, so that's a slight change. Um, another change that I wanted to point out to you is we've added some information for you guys. Um, in the past, what we would just supply for you was just the general fund, just the budget that you vote on every, every year. But now, we've included all the grant and special funds that the school district has um, authority over. So um, it starts on page 29 of the financials, the page numbers on the upper right-hand corner. So this shows you our Title I funds, Title II, the local entitlement IDA special ed grants. It also shows you special funds that we have like through CEF. It shows you all the grants that we have through CEF. Um, and so you can see all the additional funds that the school department has available to them at this time. So that's, that's a little new than what we used to do. Um, and another thing I just wanted to get, oh, I'm sorry sure. to interrupt. Um, not I'm just, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be looking for on page 29 or other pages. Not a problem. If you go to page 29, you'll see on the upper left hand corner it says interfund 20. And in upper left hand corner. No, thank you. Oh, there. Upper left, yeah. Thanks. Okay. That interfund 20 means that these are all special funds outside of the regular budget. Um, the auditor always refers them to Fund 20. So when you, when they do the audit report, you'll see in the audit report Fund 20 possibly special special um, revenues kind of thing. So I instead, I'm including that in here for you guys to see. It hasn't hadn't been included in the past, but it's money that you should also be fully aware of. So that's what that what is what. Page 29 through page 40 is all those additional funds. They're not all federal grants. Some of them are local grants, such as the CEF grants, but those are all listed here. So if you have any questions about anything in the financials, please contact me, ask me now, whatever. I'll try to do my best to um, answer any questions you have. So the next thing I wanted to quickly go over is how I analyze. The, this report. Because what I normally do to look at it to make sure we're on track is the main thing. Oh, yes, Heather? I have a question. Sure. Sorry if I'm slow on this. No. You're saying this page is not what was in a budget. 
that starting on page 29. Mm -hmm. What this page, page 29 and page 30, um, those are carry forwards from the previous year. Right. So those are allotted for in any kind of budget. What happens on the, the, this item that says encumbrances, mm -hmm. those were budgeted for in the previous year's budget. What happens is at the end of the year, we have a facilities project that's still needing, like they, they wanted to do the wiring in the middle school. We couldn't get to it last year. So that's one example of, well, we had the money in the budget last year, but we didn't get to it. So we want to carry it forward into the new year. And this is a, a perfectly acceptable procedure per the auditors. So the, the money used to pay for these, uh, many of these, are either coming from, as you mentioned, a local grant, a federal grant, or perhaps from last year's budget? This I, so for example, I'm looking at this one, tech supplies and repairs for $70,000. Yep. That seems like a big ticket number. What, what that was, that is primarily that $65,000 project that we didn't get to last year for the wiring at the middle school. Yeah. Everything in Department 9077, which is what you see right under the words Interfund 20, yes. that is just carry forwards from the previous year's budget. Okay. If you turn the page, you'll see different department titles. Like on page 30, underneath Department 9077, you have Department 9650, yes. HS Greenhouse Fund. Mm -hmm. That's for the new high school greenhouse right. that we're trying to raise money for. Right. So you'll see there's a whole bunch of different departments here that, sh that are all examples of different grants or different pockets of but money. But what this document doesn't tell us is where the money is coming from specifically. True. Is that true? Is that yeah, that's true? very true. All of these different... I mean, I don't say that critically. I'm just saying that for understanding. No, that's, you're, you are totally right. I could try to make the headings. If That's another question. If you want more detail on the headings, let me know. Because this first section is carry forwards from the previous year. As you go along, there's the high school greenhouse fund. There is, we're building money for the turf field replacement. That's what the tur turf field, um, I take it back, that's not what that turf field for. There's a lot of counts. This, these turf field expenses are just normally for regular expenses using the turf fields that we, we would use rental income to help offset expenditures. We haven't has had as much in rental incomes in the past as we had farther back, so we don't have a lot of money there, but that's what that section was set up for. And then you have the title funds, which are all federal grants. You have Title IIA, Title IIA, um, local entitlement. Those are all federal grants. So this whole section, this Fund 20, or into Fund 20, is a group of a whole bunch of different grants from all different pockets of money, which is, Heather's totally right. Seeing this, this is just the expenditure side. You don't, it doesn't show you where the money goes. It doesn't show you whether this is local or federal or what it is, so. I think, yeah, I just, to piggyback it, so it, encumbrances is listed, so that's, <laughs> the other ones are the confusing ones. Yeah. So I can, I can understand that. Uh, so, John? So I, I guess what, what um, some of the clarity might be, uh, there might be some, even still some additional information because predominantly what we've been seeing before is just the expense side mm -hmm. of a budget we'd already reviewed so right. we know the income source of that is singular. True. And so now you're having the expense size of different uh, miscellaneous incomes. So it would probably be helpful to add on um, a sort of running total also of the of where the various income sources are and were expected to be. For example, if we have delays in one of our larger grants, that would be something we'd want to be able to know and see what's uh, expected to be marked against that. Not that I'm expecting it, but that's the, that's the missing piece of, you added this, that's great. The, because everything else relates to one singular item, we know it's not as necessary to have the counterbalancing piece. But in this case, I think it would be very helpful to sort of say, here was last year's fund, here's where we are in this year's fund, that would be actually very helpful to sort of see that second half of the balance sheet of the income and expenses, particularly on the miscellaneous accounts. So um, keeps us from any surprises. Okay, one thing I do want to point out in uh, the federal grants and the CEF grants, 
is that you'll see negative accounts a lot because they're reimbursement funds. Mm -hmm. We don't get the money from the feds or from CEF until we invoice them. Right. So there is, you'll always see a negative. So that's a good point to, for you to be aware of. Just because it's negative doesn't mean the money's not there, I can. I do have an Excel spreadsheet that I prepare for the auditor that shows all the revenue, all the anticipated revenue and stuff so that I can prepare for you guys so you can see the ins and outs kind of thing. So that kind of fund accounting and reimbursement accounting is not a, not a problem at all. It's just, that we, it, it's just not visible currently. And I think actually um, that sort of specific wrinkle is actually really important to not only be visible, but be known. So because the first time that's sort of published, if it's not published with that sort of explanation, uh, you may get people reacting uh, more strongly than would be warranted. Duly noted. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. So now you've given us just enough information to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta say, Donna's like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I think I think this presentation is 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 excellent, but I, I think that the questions we're asking now are sort of we, we we see the numbers department. It's a little cryptic, and each time you said it says title, I can understand now. I know, okay, I know that means a federal grant, but perhaps if there's a, is a way to put information into those fields to say this is a CEF grant, this is a the football boosters, like for each of these, because that that's probably what will make it more digestible okay. to us so that, I mean, maybe I can, maybe you can stop by your office and you can tell me what they mean, but it may, it may make more sense just to make the field mm -hmm. um, more, have a little bit more meaning. detail, like federal yeah. versus local, mm -hmm. um, and, and see if, some of them are clear, some of them, as you said, are cryptic, so mm -hmm. it's, it is yeah. definitely, so, um, could I, use some more description. Yeah. I, I think if you, if you list the incoming funds mm -hmm. and you have these, the, 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 the account numbers have some sort of matching component to them, then you'll be pretty easy mm -hmm. to be able to flip through and say, okay, this is Title II, Account 90, 70, whatever. It's like, oh, here's the grant money f income for grant title whatever, 9, 7, Okay. Includes the accounts 970 yeah. through 9 whatever. So you could, you, if you have that other piece, you can match them in the titles as you put okay. it forward. So you can match. I, I hear you. I'm going to see if I can provide something next month. Okay. And I'll, I'm thinking this may be a work in process. So but, hopefully yeah. we'll work together and I'll get you the information that you guys want to hear. So I, I just figured, hey, I just, let's. I start. just have a comment here. I mean, we don't want to make too much work for you. If these codes are standard codes in your books, leave them as it is. If they follow the state or the regulations or the federal, leave as it is. Just make it like an index or legend, a cheat sheet yeah. saying this code equals this. We'll have that in our binder, we'll put it in our pocket, we'll put it on the table, we'll just follow that. Yeah. Okay. That's a good suggestion. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so. Um, I did want to quickly go through how I na analyze the general budget, or all of them, but pretty much the general budget, is this, what I look at first is how many pay periods we've gone through for the first, um, for the staff that are paid year-round. Almost all staff are paid year-round except for ed techs and secretaries. So what I do is we've gone through five pay periods. This, this report includes the first pay period in September. So if you take five divided by 26, because they're paid every two weeks, that's 19.23%. So you can look at most of the salary lines and see where we are. There are some that are overexpended. There are some that are a little under. That happens. People move. Somebody leaves. We hire somebody who's much more experienced at a higher rate. So you'll see that some of that fluctuation. Um, and another thing I look at is how many months are we into the fiscal year? Currently, we're into two months into the fiscal year, which is only 16.67%. And as you'll notice on the cover page, we're at 18%. The reason why we're at 18% is because during the summer, we buy a lot of our supplies. During the summer, we have a lot of facilities work done. And during the summer, we also have a lot of transportation work done on the buses. So it makes sense that we're a little higher than what you would look at if you took the 12 months and divided it per month. So I just want to let you know that's how I kind of look at it and make sure that we're on track or not. Can you just explain, so there are, what are the five pay periods then if you, if you do it monthly? Well, for currently we've gone through July. There are two pay periods in July. We went through August. There are two pay periods in August. And this report shows the first pay period in September. 
Normally, people get tw paid 26 pays a year. Almost every month is two pay periods, except for two months out of the year, where there are three pay periods. So that's how I look at when the report was created and look at how many pay periods have gone by. So you're just saying this one is five pay periods? Yes. Oh, I thought you were yes. okay. right. Because of the point in time when this report was created. Okay. Thank you. John? So you, you sort of explained this once before, and it's very helpful. But one additional bit of information, I'm not sure if this is possible, but you sort of talk about the percentage of the account that's expended. And as you indicated, a number of the accounts, some of them sort of have different patterns of spending. Mm -hmm. yes. And so one of the things, rather than also just comparing to last year's number, last year's percent at that date it would actually be very helpful. So um, I mean, in some of them, for example, CIP is going to, might move around because the numbers may move around a lot. But in general, just the, um, the percentage that you're going to use and how the, the characters of the account probably won't change much. And um, it, as a, a reviewer of these accounts, the ones I would pay attention to are the ones where, oh, we're far off of where we were previously in our spending percentage. Mm -hmm. um, that would cause me to, rather than looking number to number, because those, then you have to sort of dig in and say, okay, what's the numbers? What were the budget change? What, and, and it doesn't give me that sort of um, read as to where we are on the map. So if that's possible to do compare uh, percent usage to prior year percent usage, that would be really helpful. Okay. I will look into that. Anything else? Thank you, Catherine. Looks, looks. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome, you. welcome, guys. Thank. Um, just th the, the data continues to improve. We really appreciate it. Um, don't take our comments as not being appreciative of what you're doing. This is it continues to get better and better. We really do appreciate all the work that you do and the way you present the material. Oh, Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I, I think of this as a kind of collaborative effort. I'm trying to give you the information you need to do your job correctly. I just need feedback from you guys to let me know what you need, what you need. So Great. we'll work on this together. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. We have the superintendent's report. So our first week, week and a half of school was um, very very smooth. The opening went well. Um, we did have a bus driver resign, and um, I, you probably have heard that throughout the state of Maine, uh, bus drivers are uh, in, in shortage. Uh, we had just enough, so as a result of this resignation, um, Pat Fowler um, did some of her magic and combined two of the bus routes. Uh, yesterday was the first day that um, that the bus, the new bus routes. Um, were running, and she said yesterday was a little challenging, but I did um, get an email from her at the end of the day today, and she said it went much better. So uh, we're working on that. Um, she did in inform parents on Friday. So you received uh, the enrollment report in your packet. The total numbers indicated decrease of 23 students since September of 2017. But the encouraging news is that the kindergarten class is 28 students larger than last year's kindergarten class. So um, that is encouraging. The Maine School Board Association Conference um, is scheduled for October 25th and 26th, and I don't know if any of you have gone in the past, but um, it's, a, it's a great conference. Uh, our attorneys, Drummond and Woodson, do many of the sessions, and um, they really are relevant to what's going on in schools today. Um, there was a keynote speaker, his name is Jamie Mol Vollmer. And he's the president of Volmer Incorporated, a public education advocacy, advocacy firm working to halt the erosion of public trust and build support for America's schools. So if you're interested in attending this conference, please let Erin know and she can get you registered. So it's, it's a good conference. I go every year. Um, we are having a budget planning meeting um, between the town and the school board representatives on Thursday, September 13th at 9 o'clock um, to really plan for a collaborative budget experience and uh, it will, the committee will consist of a town manager, 
uh, the chair of the town council, the chair of the school board, I think maybe the vice chair. <laughs> um, and, and I will attend. And it'll, it'll just be a planning session on um, what can we do to, um, to bring the two groups together as we discuss the budget. So um, some of the things that we'll talk about are uh, timelines um, for the budget creation. Um, necessary information to consider, dates for combined meetings, uh, things like that. So we can give you more information um, after that meeting, that planning meeting. It's, it's a planning meeting. At the last school board meeting, I spoke about uh, the timeliness and need to enter into the strategic planning process. And uh, again, the A team met today and we've been um, studying Peter Senge's The Fifth Discipline about the arrows going in the same direction. And uh, we began to talk today about this, what is that direction? And so we really do need um, uh, a planning process that would give us our vision and mission and um, guiding principles about where, where we're going. Um, the cost of, of a facilitator for this event is about $5,000, and that would cover the cost of the planning on the day. Um, actually, it might be a day and a half, um, depending on what we decide, and preparations for the event, including um, all the necessary materials. So um, I would ask that uh, the board um, uh, have a vote of support in moving forward with this process. So I, I don't feel comfortable just moving forward on my own. I really like a, a vote of support on that, so. Would you like us to vote right now? Um, I think that's next on the agenda. Oh, <laughs> oh well, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Any questions? So I have some, some questions, comments on the, on the report, then I you want to do that before we vote. I'm happy to do it either way. Um, if you're done with your reports, I am. You are. I am. Okay. So w why don't we okay. make us? You have questions on the superintendent report? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So it was just a comment, particularly around um, some of the enrollment numbers, um, and it's just as a, a note to, to Jeff Shedd as well. It was it was an unusual reduction in the numbers of older students. Predominantly, when I went back and I've looked at the sort of how the classes mature, they tend to grow between kindergarten and about fourth grade pretty substantially. Middle school, they sort of move around fairly flat, some at the ups and downs, but generally flat. And then you lose about a little bit more, little bit when you move from middle school to high school. But this year, the drop in the middle school to high school and within the high school class seemed um, larger than it traditionally is, and I was, and, and it was a bunch of 11th grade students in particular. I was just wanted to know if there was, uh, get some character to what's going on, because it was a bit of an unusual trend, and it was a little bit surprising when I was sort of looking at some of the numbers. So um, just something to sort of um, think about and uh, report back and sort of have our finger on the pulse of, because um, those sorts of sort of class size forecasting things get to be important and that's one of the those were some of the numbers that were surprising to me when I looked at the this year's enrollment reports you'll see pretty much every single class actually either stayed the same or grew until you get to about the, what happened in the high school and middle school classes and those drop more than they have in the past um, great we can get that information and get back to you Lister? You shouldn't have brought this up, John, because you just sparked something in my mind. <laughs> Which is, um, so anecdotally, I've heard about a, a number of students um, away on exchange programs for the junior year. And so my question would be, do we count those students as part of our enrollment, even though they're studying in France or England or wherever? They're, I mean, there's just a, a number if Facebook is anything to judge by. <laughs> Everybody going to the airport saying goodbye to their children. So that, I, that might be a, an avenue to explore, and that's something I have, I have no idea if a student, they're obviously not enrolled in our school this year, so maybe they can't be counted towards enrollment, although they actually are. They're going to be bad. Students. And likewise, yeah. students that are from overseas that are spending a year mm -hmm. here, right. are they considered? It, it, yeah, it, so that's a If question. that's the kind of thing that's going on, that's exactly what we want to know. Because <laughs> those are more predictable than yeah. random. and. We will get you some information on that. Another thing, I don't know, Mr. Shedd might be able to shine more light into this. Um, I know a lot of students this year, from the junior class especially, are now enrolled in PATHS, which is a program um, where you take some classes into things that you're really interested about outside of school at a school called PATHS, um, and then take some of your core classes in CAPE, but you don't necessarily 
go to Cape Elizabeth High School as much. So I don't know if they consider those students as PATH students or as Cape Elizabeth High School students, but that could be one other reason. Thanks for bringing that up. I, I believe uh, all students that go to PATH from Cape are considered Cape students. And both, dual and both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's a good, good point. Might as well, well if, you, yeah. if you have something you have to add. <laughs> You're right, we've had an, it's, it's been a trend. I don't know, I haven't seen this this year. I, I think, I think the, there's always a little bit of a change from the middle school to the high school. Um, I do think what is absolutely unique this year and is fascinating is that we do have about six students, and I think they're mostly juniors, who are away for a semester or for a year. We cannot count those. If, for subsidy purposes, obviously because the state subsidizes us in part. So they are, as far as the state is concerned and our power school numbers are concerned, they are not students at Cape Elizabeth High School. When they return, which they will, um, they will be re-enrolled and those numbers will go up again. That, that, that's very helpful. That, that was the number that it was, it was exactly surprising to me as I looked through the, the data. It, it surprised me when I looked at it. I know we did have a few families who moved as well, but that was the difference this yeah. year. The, there's usually that level of small number, right. but that was a big number in the middle of a class. Yep. But then likewise, if there's a student here, for example, from Spain for the year? We have four exchange students. Right. Are yep. they considered part of the enrollment then, even though they're not permanent uh, residents? They, Someone has to count them. They are, they are part of the enrollment, but we don't get subsidy for those foreign exchange students. But I think in the numbers that you're seeing, but again, we have foreign exchange students come in virtually every year. So that's no different. What's different is the outflow oh. due to the other, other issues. Thanks, Jeff. And then, Donna, you mentioned the MSBA conference, um, and we usually send uh, a delegate, and I believe John is our appointed delegate for that meeting. I, I was the alternate, and the alt Barbara wasn't able to go, so I was actually the delegate last year. I went. It was a great conference. I'd encourage anyone to go. I, I thought, though, we had decided yep. that you were the... I'm happy to do it again. I'm just, yep. I'm just saying you were the delegate yep. for this coming yep. year, and Nasser was the alternate. Yep. So just between you for two... For the delegate assembly. Yeah. Yes. So just between you two, you can decide... Um, you both can go, obviously, if you want to. Okay, now we have, uh, may I have a motion, please, for item six. I move the school board supports a strategic planning process. Second. Any discussion? What is the process? Is it putting RFP out, talking to consultants? Uh, how does it work? So did you, do we hire a consultant? We do it together? Does the consultant come over here and we do it as a team? Um, the process I participated in, we, we hired a facilitator. And there was a, a Friday night, Saturday uh, group of uh, members of the community, a large number of members of the community. Um, people are invited, um, trying, trying to get people from all areas and representatives from all different um, community groups. Um, so they, like I said, it was, it's a, it was a large number. The one I participated in was, uh, we had 70 from uh, the community. So the facilitator led us through um, various activities, um, looking at um, what, um, what were some historical aspects of the community, um, thinking about impacts of um, things that were going on today in our, in our world, on our educational system, and then ending with some talking about um, what we wanted our schools to be in the future. So there were, you know, it was a, it was a day and a half of uh, action-packed activities, but all reflecting on things that impacted our schools and, and where we wanted our schools to go. Lots of um, small group work, chances for people to share. Um, everybody in the group shared. How long does it, the process get involved? Is it three weeks, a couple of months? Um, to get ready for this? To get ready or to complete it? Yeah, uh, yeah it, it, start from the it takes some time. Um, there's a committee, a planning committee that gets together and identifies people in the community that should be invited. Um, there's personal invitations that go out. 
Um, then following the community forum, um, there are um, themes that are identified, um, then goals that are created and presented to the board, So, which um, that all is done by a subcommittee. So, And then, of course, the creating of the strategic plan itself based on the goals. So we have the goals, and then what, what do we need to get to the goals? What do we need to do? Are there anyone invited from other districts, from school districts, that may have possibly some input? They could be. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'm particularly excited about this. Um, I participated in um, the community gathering for our now uh, used up and done, whatever, uh, strategic plan. And um, I'm excited to hear about the process that you went through that you felt was really positive because um, bringing in the historical aspect, having, I think that's a, that was a, a critical piece that we missed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important for people to be able to talk about the history and what they feel proud of, what they wish they could continue. Like that, I think it helps bring people together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am very supportive of this process. Um, I would um, be careful of, um, I think personal invitations sound great, but this is a very, I think, over, 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 overarchingly involved um, community and so it, it, who knows which way you want to go with that it might just be if you want to be a part come because this community in general really um, cares a lot about education mm -hmm. and then finally um, as we move along in the process it might be worth thinking about we do have the CAPE acronym that uh, what how much do we change how much do we you know I think we really do need a, a new strategic plan and my vote would be more condensed, but that's another. <laughs> um, but as far as the, you know, the the mission statement, you know, there could be things that, you know, still are relevant. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. so who knows? Definitely. But it's it's exciting. Thank you for helping us embark on this. Um, I I totally um, agree with Elizabeth. Thank you so much. We it's very exciting. I think it's it is it's exciting. Perfect timing that we're doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm with your arrival and um, um, and I, I, I wholly support it. I'm just curious, where would the 5,000 come from? The, the money, do we have that built in somewhere? <laughs> I'm just curious, because I know we have like nothing left. So. <laughs> we will look at the budget. You would, okay, yeah. all right. So. Um, I mean, it's gotta be done well, and it's mm -hmm. gotta be done right, yeah. and I know it costs money. I'm going through the town comp, Plan. We've hired two consultants just to approach our work, but um, just was curious about that one. So, no, thank you, John. So I just like to speak again in support of the idea and the plan, and also to comment on the um, the financial aspect of it. I actually think that this is some of the best money we'll spend. That this is something that's overdue and we've underinvested in, and. It's really going to do it well. It's going to involve the community and really set a clear direction for what we're trying to accomplish. And um, really, that, that's where we have to start. And spending the money to have professionals who don't do this and people that have worked with before to be able to produce that kind of a process um, is really money well spent. Um, so I'm highly supportive and very encouraging of this process. Heather? Uh, sort of to piggyback, and I had similar thoughts that uh, the number of six years that many people that you brought up, you need a very skilled and talented yes. facilitator mm -hmm. or somebody who's a professional and knows what mm -hmm. they're doing to do this. So again, uh, the work is important, the community input is important, um, and so I would be in support as well. I think it will come back in many ways in a more positive light. Thanks. Oh, is the 5,000 starts the process or will the end we will get a report of the strategic plan as well? Is there going to be other surprise costs after that or not? No. This is it, okay. No. I think your administrative team would take over after that and okay. do that work. 
All those in favor? Oh, did you want to say something? Was, so this is somebody that you've worked, like there, there's somebody specific in mind and... I do. Yes. Yes. And you I, I don't know if she's available. I haven't talked to her, but um, I would certainly do some research to see if um, I've been through the process with this person and, and know that she's very good. She's worked um, all over New England really doing this. So if she's not available, I would research somebody else. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I fully support the process. I think um, it's really important to know where we're going and, and have as many people on board with that idea as possible. So, yeah. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. I just want to say thank you to Donna for asking for our support. Oh. And I'll just go ahead and including us in this. I really appreciate that, too. Good point. All right, moving on to item seven. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the student educational trip to Greece during April 2019. Put the mic in front of you. Put the mic in front of you. <laughs> Hello. I move we approve the student educational trip to Greece during April 2019. I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Who gets to go to Greece? I know. Can I go? I know. <laughs> I think it's sophomores, it's, juniors, yeah. and seniors. I, um, I believe, or oh, it's open to them. I actually do have a question about it, if yeah, that's okay. Sure. Um, it says the cost per student is uh, $3,700 and descriptions of fundraisers to offset our bake sales at the cost, um, to offset the cost of bus transportation to Logan. And um, I don't know, maybe bake sales make a ton of money, but can't imagine it making that much money. So I, I just have a question of if it is open to all students, that's a good chunk of change and bake sales don't seem like it balances that. So I'm just wondering if you can speak. I know we believe so strongly in this school of making it available to everybody. So um, it's it does seem accessible to some. It does. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Our, our bake sales are very popular, but they're not going to pay for <laughs> students to go to Greece. Um, this is a trip that will largely be funded by families. I talked to Mary Page, who's a teacher, a social studies teacher at the high school, who's going to be the leader of the trip. Um, the bake sales largely will cover the bus trip to Logan Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary assured me that there are scholarships available through the company that organizes this trip, so that if families okay. are really in need and and I think probably can contribute. I will say about um, um, this trip is almost a non-school trip, and in the past, a long time ago, there were discussions with the board about whether this even this kind of trip, because it's not really connected to school. It's not really coming out of a curriculum. It happens to be led by teachers, and if all the plans go the way that they're supposed to go, there will be no lost school time either for teachers or students. Um, the reason it's before the board is, depending on what happens with transportation, sometimes there are last minute changes in travel arrangements and things like that, and it's possible that it could cost teachers or students up to a day, but no more than a day uh, for travel. But the goal is hopefully that there'll be no lost school time at all. The insurance comes through the company. Um, it's not really a school trip in that sense if there's issues that go, go on and that kind of thing. But the fun, there is fundraising that's happening. But it will be an expensive trip for the families um, who are participating in it unless they apply for and receive a scholarship through the company that's organizing it. Yeah. Um, your comment of it not being a school trip, I sort of have a different take of it when it is the teacher pulling from the pool of the student body. That in and itself makes it seem like it's a school trip. The, the teacher, um, you know, is not pulling from the newspaper and anybody who wants to go and is willing to come, please call me and sign up. But the fact that it's pulling from our student body, putting it out there, I'm sure it's being advertised, all the students in the school are seeing this, um, that in and of itself to me makes it seem like it's a school trip, whether it's directly tied to the curriculum or not. And I could be wrong on that, but that's just my take. It's sort of an in, it's sort of an in-between trip. I actually think there hasn't been advertising in school. At least I'm not positive about this trip, but I know the last time this similar kind of trip yeah. came up. It, the Cuba? Was, what? 
Was it that the Cuba? No, Cuba was definitely a school trip. Okay. No, this was even before. You know, Cuba was absolutely definitely a school trip that okay. was connected to the students and was advertised widely in the school. I don't. I'd have to correct to find out if I'm if I'm wrong about that one. But, okay. Um, perhaps, perhaps this one has been more than um, um, just hasn't registered with me. Um, but it is an in-between one, so that's why we came before the board. But um, the insurance liability for this trip will not rest with the board; it will rest with the <laughs> company that's sponsoring it, um, mm -hmm. which they have, which actually was the company that that arranged and organized the Cuba trips a couple years ago mm -hmm. and previous trips before that. They're really excellent. Um, they do a great job, um, but. I think that is the major reason, at least historically, why the, um, the trip is, is before the board, just to cover the possibility that, and because there's a little bit of a gray area to it, so it made more sense to come before the board. Are there, is there a possibility if there's a student from the school who would like to go on the trip and um, does not get scholarship from the company, which is nice to hear that they offer that. If the school has funds that can help support that student to go, is that, or is that not happen? That would be a, a big, that would be a big ticket item to be able to do. What there could probably happen is um, a, a grant request to the high school parent association or something like that. Mm -hmm. There are various. Ways. So there are ways. There are ways to support to families, and we would do everything we could that would to support families. Um, I, I think there's already been so anyway. So I, I think the families who have have an interest in going have already sort of made their identified themselves. Although there will be other opportunities, I think, to for kids to do that. So so there. Where there's a will, particularly in this community, there is typically a way, but it's not something that I could easily turn to the school budget for and say, yes, sure. this is how we could do this. Mm -hmm. We might be able to contribute something with some creativity. But I just want to add um, that these trips, t I, as far as I've been aware of them, happen every two years. And they first announced, and I remember they did announce Greece, um, as they did Cuba, almost two years prior. So when my son was a freshman, um, he heard about Cuba, and he went at the end of his sophomore year. So families and children who are interested, my son included, have that much time to save up, for, you know, for whatever allotment they're supposed to save up for. Mm -hmm. um, just it, there's a lot of um, leeway. So. Thank you, Jeff. So, I have a question. I'm not sure if. Um, if there's anyone who can clarify it for me. So if this isn't a school, it's not a school sponsored trip, right? But it's before us to sort of approve it. So I think by, by us approving it, we're sort of saying the board sees this, we see the number of chaperones. It sort of then becomes a school trip, for, arguably from a you know, legal perspective. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how does, that, how does that work? Let's just say the French class was sending a group of students and it was a school trip to France. Does the district have, have insurance that covers that sort of activity? And it do, where does this fall in, in, in that arena? So is this covered by our insurance or is this, are they, I are they outside I think the, the company the that organizes this covers, has the insurance. Um, there was some information on this World Strides. Um, Yes, actually, this pamphlet contains information on sickness, accident, and trip insurance. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to understand is there's a it sounds like there's a gray area between a truly school-sponsored trip and then this trip, which is it, it's pulled from the school, but you know, it sounds like we're saying it's not a school trip because it's not a specific class, but it is a teacher who's organized it within the school mm -hmm. community. So. How would it compare, Jeff, to a club sport that goes to D.C. for, like, de debate or world council? Or, do, do you know? I mean, because they have to get from here to D.C. or wherever they go. And it, there's, in terms of cost? You no, know, in terms of, let's say, insurance. Like, insurance, logistics, resources, 
So insurance for a club trip that goes to D.C., like if the AP government class goes to Washington, D.C., that goes before the board to get, and that's, that is covered, my understanding is, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert, by so. the insurance of the school district. Mm -hmm. This is a different beast, in that, mm -hmm. and parents have been made very clear, this is a different beast. Mm -hmm. That is, that's, that's why I think um, a number of years ago when these trips were occasionally started, the board was wanted to make sure that there was insurance in place from the company uh, that would be kicking in in the event there was an accident, an injury, or something like that. Um, so, so that's why we, um, Mary Page was sensitive because she has been involved in organizing mm -hmm. similar trips in the past to make sure that the board has in front of it the insurance that's that's provided by the company that's essentially contributed to or paid for by the families who are, who are going. And then are the parents made? Are they? Um is it made known to the parents that this is not a Cape Elizabeth School District a trip? So uh, I, talked to, I talked with Mary about a number of things uh, earlier today. I didn't specifically ask that question. What I do know is I, I'm pretty sure because she has been involved in similar trips in the past, not mm -hmm. just the Greece one, but before this, more comparable trips that she's always been very clear with parents about that. I, there is certainly plenty of time to get some additional form signed to make that mm -hmm. absolutely crystal clear and in writing that this, this, is, this, is, this mm -hmm. is essentially before the board to endorse the possibility that either the teachers or the students might miss a day of school. Um, and that's really the issue for the board mm -hmm. more than anything else. Elizabeth? So, um, I think that whether or not we define this as a school trip or whatever, I, I appreciate that discussion. However, you know, how, wherever it lands, I think that it's important that the board is aware of these trips. And so um, we may decide in the future that we don't need to approve these sorts of trips, but I think it would be important that we are aware. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as you said, especially, you know, the impact to the school day really is, I guess, where the school board has any say with anything to do with this particular trip, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I would agree, absolutely. I think we absolutely need to be aware of it, but we should be clear where it's falling in terms of is it a school trip, is it not? And then and the parents need to be aware. So, Maybe the policy committee needs to look at the we could. trip policy. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're always looking for more things. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the question then is also, is the motion before us the correct motion? Because this motion is written as it, proving it as if it were a school trip, <clears throat> rather than affirming we're aware of the impact that this trip may have on the school district, which is a very different motion. Because as it's written now, it may be very well the case that if we approve it as a school trip, while there is insurance in place, uh, some might view the district as secondary, uh, secondarily liable. So if, if what we're actually approving is the notice of the impact on the school district, we should um, think about amending the motion to say that, rather than it's written as all other school trips are amended, it's on the same form that school trips are on, and it's a very different thing than what we're actually voting on. Yeah. So I would like to move that we amend uh, the, the item seven to say we are uh, uh, affirming and approving any impact this uh, student trip may have on the district. Uh, so, so any better word than that? Yeah. Any uh, further discussion? That's a really good point, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have to vote on the amendment? We have to vote on the amended amendment. Yeah. Yeah. All those in favor? Okay. Great. Um, item eight. May I have a motion? I move we approve the following job description, district mentor. A second. Any discussion? Don, do you mind describing the district mentor? Well, I'm going to call on Kathy to do that. Okay. <laughs> it seems to be 
already have, is this just an update? No. Oh, okay. No. Um, so we have, um, for a, a number of years, provided a mentor to teachers who are new to Cape Elizabeth and carry a conditional or provisional certification. And we pro it's actually a state mandate, although we would do it anyway, but we provide a mentor to them for two years. Um, it occurred to us that teachers, well, you know, ed educators, so anyone on a, on a teacher contract who um, had professional certification but were new uh, to Cape Elizabeth might still benefit from having a buddy um, whom they can ask all sorts of questions of and, and just get, get acclimated to the district more quickly. So, um, so the, the, the duties, duties are, uh, I would say, less, less onerous than, than those um, of a mentor who's moved, helping a, a teacher who's provisionally certified move to professional certification. This is really just, this is, is just, um, it just, just providing that go-to person for somebody who is new to the district. It's an upper link. It's an upper link, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's an upper link for new staff. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, sure. Any further discussion? So I understand it's a paid position coming from a grant and it's starting next year, <laughs> fiscal year 2019. <laughs> the money. Yes. I wrote a, I wrote a project um, under Title IIA to provide the stipend for this position. And, and thus far, there's only one mentor we're approving, right? Cor the, you, the, the other mentorship you've approved years ago, that's... Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this, so this, this is a new position, right? Okay. Okay. Thanks for recognizing that need. All those in favor? Item 9, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following 2018-2019 administrative and athletic extracurricular personnel nominations as listed in our packet, because they're numerous. May I have a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Next we have um, the consideration of the following policies for first reading, IKB on homework, JJIF management of concussions and other head injuries, and JJJ high school co-curricular and extracurricular activities eligibility. No votes required, but we can discuss. Um, so uh, the uh, policy committee has been working um, since last spring on homework policy and homework policy procedures. Um, before you tonight for first read, you, if you look at the, the copy marked draft, there's another one right behind it that doesn't say draft, which that can be a little tricky. We might work on um, having red line next <laughs> Um, but so the draft policy is the, um, really it's just a little bit of an update. There's no um, substantial um, philosophical change. Um, so we worked with um, all administrators from the buildings. We worked with, um, Kathy Stankard was there. We had parent involvement. And um, so those regulations are not before the board because board uh, approval is not necessary, although we did talk about them, but the policy itself does need approval. And so what we did do is there were, there were some um, definitions and references that didn't really make a lot of sense that we, that we moved out. And um, we made sure that we wanted um, to encourage communication among teachers around um, what they're assigning, when they're assigning it, and that sort of thing. And that philosophy went in here. Um, you'll notice that there's been a removal of um, telling parents, you know, when and how much they're supposed to help students with their homework. And really, um, we we every home is different. It's hard. It's hard to say, you know, at this age level you should, you know, help a little, or at this age you shouldn't, and that sort of thing, because 
really, you know, homework is meant to be, you know, largely independent. And at the same time, the point was well made that every home does not view homework the same way or give it the same priority. And so it's, it's difficult to talk about parent involvement, um, where one home might have, you know, somebody who um, is very involved and, and helps out and there's a dedicated quiet space. Another home might be chaotic and um, well-intended but not able. So it's, it's really not fair for the board to advise about parent involvement. So that's, that was kind of our thinking around that. Um, so although uh, the, what we did see, I want to say did the, the uh, IKB-R come before the board in June, I believe, where those were the regulations where we did make several tweaks just to sort of reiterate with that, um, you know, homework in the elementary levels has really been found to be useful as a um, habit builder, but not, not necessarily a skill builder. And um, really, in, in all grades, we don't want, you know, the, the homework used as a punishment. Homework, you know, or not doing homework is not meant um, to be used as a reason to keep a child in from recess in any of the grades. Things like that that we, you know, we really stand for. We, you know, those are those are still there, and we reiterated things around, especially in high school, communicating with teachers. If you feel like things are out of control, things are difficult, reach out, talk to your teachers. The teachers are very receptive. They're, you know, they want to hear from parents if things feel like they're spinning out of control for your student. So we kind of underscored those things. Um, so there's where we are with homework policy. I want to add one comment. I apologize, to I, Elizabeth, I wasn't at the last policy meeting, so if you had covered this, but one thing that we talked about was that the policy has a lot of good information in it, and one of the issues might be that it's not necessarily making it to the parents' mm -hmm. ears, and that it, it would be a good idea. I, I did receive a policy in, a, in a, a folder this week from my son's third grade teacher, so kudos to Mrs. Forsyth. Um, <laughs> But I think that that was one of the things we talked about was like the policy is good, it just needs to be made known mm -hmm. and, that it, and it, that would help, I think, get everyone on the same page. Um, so I agree. One of the things that came out of the committee um, in June and then again at the end of the summer when we met was that we really hope that the principals will be communicating with their teachers um, and reminding them that these policies exist and, and the board really expects teachers to follow these policies and procedures, and then to make these procedures um, available and known to parents. And because there's some, I had a question today, I was at the MSPA meeting and someone raised their hand and said, hey, my son heard that um, you guys are working on the homework policy and there's no more homework anymore. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, no. So I think it would be helpful. I agree, Hope. I think that's the, one of the biggest things we can do is just improve communication around this policy in particular. So it would be great if, you know, in an email or something that, that this went out to all parents as well as staff, policy and regulations. John. Sorry, Susanna, you're running the meeting. I'm happy for a second. <laughs> I couldn't. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't have So, um... In looking at the homework policy, it really does sort of go hand in glove with the regulations. And I, I, I still have concerns. I, th I actually think that this policy could be and should be even more parent independent. I feel like homework, we don't know the home situations of all students and the policies need to apply to all students and homework should be independent of your home situation. Um, and that should be the standard. Now, that doesn't mean others, you don't, it's, it's, it, it, the question is what's mandatory? What's the floor? What's the policy on that? And that's, and I feel strongly that it should be independent and not required of, of parents. If, if they're not able to, then they, they shouldn't be expected to. Mm -hmm. um, if they can, that's great and we welcome that. But it's what standard do you set as the minimum? The, the, the other thing is um, I still continue to come back to if things in early grades, I'm very skeptical of homework in early grades, and I understand the idea to build um, work habits, but the thing is, <clears throat> unless those work habits are actually being taught in the school, we should not be sending homework home as work habits. 
anything that's homework needs to be taught in the school first. And I don't think we're checking that, that that's happening. And if we're saying it's work habits, it's like free for all for work habits. And I think that's a bad idea. I think in, in general, unless we're going to do homework right, we shouldn't do it because the benefit is minimal. And there's so many other things that is actually helpful to students in their learning education and environment that are more so than homework. Eat dinner together, get outside, all kinds of things like that, particularly in the early grades, actually have a better effect. And I think if we're going to say it's for work habits, the burden lies on us first to say, we're teaching those work habits, we taught them in the class, and now we want to have you to practice them at home. And until such time as we can say, we know these work habits are being taught, they shouldn't be homework. And I would turn this sort of back to the director of you know, teacher and, and learning and say, it's like, it's like on homework, this is a big deal because these are the kind of things, our problem in the school district is not necessarily skill mastery. It's more things along stress. We were having in the middle school now the seminar on, on uh, you know, mental health and, and all kinds of issues around that. And homework is a big part of that. You know, if you're on the board now and you raise your hand and say, you know, most of the homework that came home for my kids was great. I wish they all had homework like that all the time. I don't, I'm not going to raise my hand. It's not meeting the standards that we want it to meet. And we have an obligation to make sure it does that first. And if it doesn't, don't do it. And that's not reflected in the policy here, I don't think. I, you know, I think there's a lot of good ideas and a lot of things that as you advance, but there really is this sort of sequence that you should be doing it first in school before it ever gets sent home. And if there's no checkpoint in our policy that says, I know this student can do this, I saw them do it in class, and now it's part of the homework. To me, that's what the homework policy should be, is that I know they can do it, this is something that will benefit from practice. Because otherwise, it's not a benefit, it's just a stress. How many times have you sat around trying to get your kids to do homework and you look at the homework and saying, this isn't really helping them. So the question is, you know, homework policy and the way we set this thing is how we set the culture and how we set the expectations. And I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. This happens to be something that, you know, that sort of got my attention when it came across my desk this time. I wish I had been involved more deeply earlier. But I actually think it's a really big deal and a chance to sort of think about and turn the district in a better, more helpful direction for kids and parents. And so I would urge that we look at this a little more deeply in terms of what homework is really beneficial how do we keep it within that box and guarantee you what we send home is really worth doing? And then I think we're in good shape to sort of have this a policy apply. But right now we're sort of saying, here it is, whatever it is, you do it. And it, I think that's backwards. If I may just address, so you touched on, we did talk about that in great, in great length in the policy meeting. And we did, we sort of unpacked the policy and there is, there is actually language that addresses it. It says, teachers have a responsibility to provide adequate understanding of the assignments and also provide timely feedback, et cetera. But I think we, 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 looked, we thought about it, we thought, well, this isn't being communicated. We, we, we talked about the issue where your child comes home with something and they say, I, didn't, I don't know how to do this. We didn't cover this in, in math today. So the point was, it's there, but it's not being fleshed out or it's not, maybe it needs to be discussed at the administrator's level each year. It needs to be sort of made, highlighted, and you're, you're doing that right now. Right? So, and, and, and I do think it, it, it is worth being clear about homework policies at the elementary level, the middle school level, at the high school level, because there are some significant differences, and the benefits at the elementary level are minor. And the work habits piece, like I said, unless we can say we know they're teaching work habits, and I know they weren't for my kid, then the homework has no benefit, it's only a de detriment. It's taken away from other stuff that could be good. So. so John, in the regs, we do have delineations for elementary, middle, and high school around expectations. And um, we did talk at length, and uh, Jason was part of the conversation and kind of spearheaded the, the top of the discussion around um, could we do better at teaching the study habits were sort of trying to build and using homework to build. 
And so I believe it's a work in progress. And what I would kind of turn back to you and turn back to the board is, you know, homework is sort of a big deal. And so maybe it could be um, part of our discussion in um, the strategic planning that it's kind of bigger than policy, really, yep. which is get the pan get everybody kind of involved in this conversation. Um, we love having this really high performing. You know, basically we have a college preparatory high school. Is the, you know is there another way to do it? I don't know. Is there a better way? You know, I don't know. But let's let's make this the bigger conversation. So. I fully agree and endorse that approach because what this seems like to me is we understand that there's some fundamental issues here and we're still working from the prior draft. And I was like, one of the things, I, lessons I learned doing a lot of presentations is a guy used to tell me, you can't get a good short presentation by cutting down a big presentation. You've got to start fresh and get the concept right. And I just feel like the concept we want in homework is not here in this policy. And I really feel like we need a fresh start on a, what is the high level concept we want on homework. And that's exactly something that belongs in a strategic plan. But that's really a first, a high order and important order of business. Because I don't think you can't fix this with a comma and a deletion and a, and a is, is the, the concept of how it's approached in terms of saying, we make sure that we teach it first before we ever send it home. That's not in here. It's. It's allowed, but that's not the crux of what's here. Um, and all of the points that you sort of talk about how homework is used, I think we want to be very clear about, uh, about exactly you know, where those expectations lie. Um, and I, again, I think we often do too much and are worse for it in this community. Thank you, John. I think those are really good points. And, um to be brought up the next policy, and then definitely, as you both have suggested, strategic plan. Um, Liz, uh, Kimberly, sorry. I um, so I I appreciate all the work that you guys have done on this, and oh, well, this is the yeah the new. Um, and I don't know if this is even policy. It, it, it strikes me more as sort of the curriculum cu curricular alignment, but um, curriculum alignment. But um, I I feel like we've had just uh, I had a personal at home experience years like in first grade where we have homework every single night and then second grade we have nothing. So if we're you know kind of working on the idea of skill building in the elementary school years, um, I, I think that needs to be looked at as well. And like I said, I don't know if this is really policy, but it's homework. And you know, I think if we we're did discuss it in the the, the IKB R, which is but it's a recommendation and not there, you know, that come, kind of comes around vertical alignment, it would sound to me. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of what I was thinking. Thank you. I think it's a big concept. Yes, and I, I appreciate it. I think we got the ball rolling. Yeah. <laughs> We've had several months of robust conversation. And it will be back in, <laughs> back again. Um, are people comfortable moving on to management of concussions? Because we do have um, Jeff Shedd and Deb Braxton here to talk about, there are some substantial changes to the management of concussions and other head injuries. And we wanted to be able to talk to the board about this. It's not that we have um, just decided that we don't care about concussions anymore or <laughs> Um, but there have been some um, new developments since we originally adopted the impact testing plan um, that we talk about. And I don't know about you, but we all went into power school and we all, that, I think for high school students, I don't know that we do it for anybody else, but, and we acknowledge that, you know, our student, if they play a sport, is going to have to do this impact testing baseline protocol and that sort of thing. And if you've read through the policy, we are actually talking about moving away from that baseline testing. Um, and it's not because we don't believe concussions are important, but there have actually been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of research and a lot of a different practice um, since that was first implemented. So if I may. Yeah, and I'm, since you, I wouldn't have come up normally, but I came up since you mentioned my name. But this is Deb Braxton, who works for the doctors and the offices that diagnose concussions and the is, is, is at, at the high school and is very conversant with sort of the changing approach that doctors are now taking compared to when the policy was first, first implemented. So 
Um, Deb. I'll try and give a brief synopsis. So about 11 years ago, um, the main concussion management initiative started. At that time, uh, Mickey Collins, who graduated from the University of Southern Maine, was working with, in Pittsburgh with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they were developing this test, which is called the impact test, to assess some sort of baseline neurological function. Um, it involves some things like speed of processing, memory, um, visual stuff. And so at the time, there were a lot of different practices doing a lot of different things. And they were looking to standardize the assessment of a concussion. So they developed this baseline sort of neuropsychological exam. It was computerized, and students could take it and then would have a baseline, and then if they were concussed or injured, then we could re-administer the tests, and then we would look for differences. And so that sort of took hold here in the state of Maine because of the Maine Concussion Management Initiative. Um, and they were sort of spearheaded by Dr. Bill Hines, who worked out of Orthopedic Associates in Portland. And he would see a lot of the students, um, he'd take a look at the baselines, he'd see them afterwards and compare and do post-tests. Um, originally when this started in the district, it was before my time, but some of those post-tests were done here at the high school. That sort of fell by the wayside because they require a quiet space, a computer designated solely to impact testing, and then it required someone to interpret that post-test. Um, I've gone to training through MCMI, but it was always Dr. Hines who gave those recommendations around, yes, the student's cleared to return to sport. So what has happened recently is that um, we've been doing post-tests, pre-tests forever. For as long as I've been here, I'm starting my sixth year. And they started much earlier than that. But what's happening is since Dr. Hines retired two years ago, and even before he retired, he really was one of the only people that was doing the post-test. You will not get a post-test from Intermed, Maine Medical Partners, um, I'm blanking on the other one, Barnes Point. Those folks were not doing it, it was only Dr. Hines and maybe Dr. Ouellette down at um, OA in, uh, so in um, Saco. So what, what we found is that we're doing all these baselines and no one's looking at them and no one's doing a post-test. So then it behooves the question, why are we testing and why do we need to if no one's looking at those, the data? And so that's why we're here tonight because we feel that um, there's, a huge, there's a huge commitment on the part of the school district, monetary as well as time, to um, obtain those pre-tests and we have to chase this, we have two student athletes here so they know that we've been, we have to chase them down in ninth grade and 11th grade. We need, um, we need approval from the parents and then we have these test results that we do nothing with. Um, so we're proposing because there are other standards and assessments and ways that individual pediatrician practices manage concussions, we're proposing that we stop pre-testing our students. Um, there are other schools in the district, I mean not in our district, but in the area, like Falmouth has made it sort of, you know, your, your choice this year if you feel like it. Um, there are also other districts that are still doing it, but they're in those districts, they're more Southern Maine and the athletic trainers are full-time employees, they do the pre-test, they do the post-test, they manage it and they have some sort of a consulting physician. Um, and that's how they do it in their districts. But what we're finding here is that we just don't have anyone doing post-tests anymore, and so there's no need for the pre-test. Um, the only thing I will, I do, I will make one correction, Elizabeth, when we have students sign the permission for the impact, they are also having the parents give permission to follow the school's protocol around concussion management. We're not asking to approve anything on that right now. We're gonna have to come back because that actually is a work in progress to look at that protocol. Um, all we're asking for right now in the new policy standard is to just remove the pre-impact testing. What I wanted to highlight for the board that you brought up in our meeting is that um, no matter what, you know, impact, you know, pre-test, post-test, whatever, all students have to be cleared by a doctor before they can return to school and sports and that sort of thing. So uh, none of that changes. And what 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 Deb did share with me is that um, over the years there have been 
you know, over, you know, over 100 concussions or something. You, there were a lot, a lot of concussions um, in six years. And then, you know, that's the number of doctors that these, you know, these students had to go see, and only one or two ever requested the pretest. But there, so, I mean, that really does beg the question, why are we doing this? And, and it, we're not saying that we don't care or that whatever, but the doctors aren't using them. And they still have to be cleared by a medical professional. They do. If you're suspected of having a concussion, you're pulled from the game, typically by the athletic trainer. And then we ask that you go and see a physician, and they can diagnose a concussion or they cannot diagnose a concussion. But either way, we need a note that says you have a concussion or you do not. And that if we don't have that note, you cannot return to sports until we have clearance. Um, we, because, um, you know, really everyone has to, we send them to the doctor and their doctor can determine whether the student has a concussion or not. And they've been doing that for years without post-test information or even requesting pre-test information. Um, they've just been doing it on their own accord and that's sort of where we're coming from. We just want to let them to continue to do that and we can probably eliminate the pre-test. The other point, I'm sorry, no, oh, go ahead. The other point uh, is that we worked on um, this particular policy to uh, extend beyond just sports because students get concussions not just from playing sports on our teams. And so this policy really talks about all students because a student can get a concussion outside of the school day, but that's going to have an impact on their school day. And it has you know, nothing to do with sports that are affiliated with the, the school department. And, and, and that also would mean that they didn't have a school run pretest because they were playing for the Cape Elizabeth Soccer Club or they were playing on the jungle gym. So, right. I have a question. So pretest is basically to identify if a person has had a concussion or and is that more of a, a medical record that should be done by the doctor, uh, by individual families? What it is actually is just a, it's a baseline test. It doesn't say, oh, you've had a concussion or oh, you've had a brain injury. Um, it's basically to have numbers that are for you, personalized for you or for the student. And then we compare, they would compare the post-test numbers to your personal baseline. Okay. Um, but what they found in general is now we have some more normative data that can, that you can use to say, this looks pretty normal, that looks pretty abnormal, um, but they're not even using that either. They're just sort of, we, we've just been doing pretests and we've not um, been using that data. It doesn't get used for anything unless someone needs a post-test. It just sits in the computer and it stays there. Um, and there's no real need to have it for anything else. So if you're not using it to compare to a post-test, it begs the question of why do we need to do it in the beginning? Well, my question would be if, if a trainer is given the task of giving all those post-tests and the doctor isn't using, and the trainer can't clear that student to go back to participation anyway, right. Right. and the doctor's not using it, that was sort of what right. won me over. Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. So that's concussions. <laughs> and, uh, Jeff, you probably want to stick around for the draft eligibility policy. <laughs> um, so the eligibility policy, JJJ, was a policy that we worked on and um, tweaked in particular around adding um, different consequences for habits of work. And I think um, many of us have heard um, from, if you have high school students, that you've, you've heard that there's going to be kind of a, a pause and a rethink about how to measure and how to work on habits of work. And so Jeff had, had kind of flagged at the end of the school year last year, I think we're going to need to talk about this. And he delivered as promised in August. And so we have um, essentially moved our policy back to um, a similar form of checkpoints. 
And habits of work are not a part of the eligibility policy at this time. Jeff, have I done you justice at all? Do you have any? You did very well. So um, this all goes back to some changes, some things, some major things that are absolutely staying the same in terms of our approach to proficiency-based education. Course learning targets at the high school, just as Kathy mentioned, our course learning targets at the middle school and elementary school as well. But we learned a tremendous amount um, uh, last year, so we're making some revisions, and, and at some point, probably it would be great to have a more detailed conversation so the board can have questions answered about what we're doing this year, but we're really focusing on higher level skills of reading, writing, research, and other things that we really know the kids that are the most important things and wanting to generate a conversation among teachers about that. The, we did an awful lot of work last year, proficiency-based education. Um, we have a lot of work in front of us with this new model as well. And so the proposal is to, as, as you said quite aptly, is to put a pause on habits of work the way we were doing it last year was extremely well-intentioned and had many unintended consequences that sometimes were counterproductive to the, to the intention. Um, and so we recognize that. I think students sometimes recognize that as well. Um, and given that our intention is to keep that pause, at least for this year, it didn't make sense to have the eligibility policy not in line with that. So, the proposal is to uh, return to an eligibility policy which is strictly based on students' academic performance now. Let us get the academic piece of what we're doing in proficiency-based education, feeling more comfortable, right, and making sense to everybody, and then getting back to the issue of habits of work. So that's, that's the proposal. Yes. Jeff, um, what, what were some of the unintended consequences of habit of so some um, teachers were finding that students' work performance was actually lower than it had been in the past. Um, that depended in large part on whether or not the students had, um, were, had, it depended what season we were in. If students were, a season was coming up that the students cared about, whether athletics or mock trial or any of their jazz band or whatever, then they would seem to, Put on, put in a, well, let me step back and say this. Our work performance among students at Cape Elizabeth High School has never really been especially dependent. I mean, our students were blessed with students who work hard. 90% of them do 90% of their work. There are some, that may be a slight exaggeration, but it's, it's that's, so, um, so with, and what our teachers were finding is that it was actually declining in some cases, even as we were now reflecting habits of work. And it, again, it largely had to do with with that issue of what season they were in, because kids, in kids' mind, habits of work became all about eligibility, work performance became all about eligibility, and it was a very confusing message. And we could have spent a lot of time and cleaned that up, and I'm confident that when we unroll our next version of habits of work, it will be, we'll deal with those issues. But right now, we had so many other issues to deal with. I will also say that I think that the policy bred a fair amount of cynicism among students and teachers about the value of it. And so there were many mixed messages that were going around and misunderstandings. I don't know if Piper and Julia want to add anything about that, add your perspectives to it. But, but it was just, to, we want to do this, we want to do it right, it's really important. Um, but right now we want to get the academic side of proficiency-based education right as a higher priority. Julia? Um, well, I felt like, um, just like from others, like talking to other students and um, like students who didn't play a sport or like participate in uh, another activity were just like, I don't really need to do my homework because I won't, I don't need to care about if I'm eligible or not. So like they don't need to care about their how grade, whereas students who like do need to like be able to be eligible, like really found that like kind of unfair almost because like they weren't doing, like the other, these other kids weren't doing their homework and like weren't, didn't really have a punishment for not doing it as much. Like, whereas like these, everyone else um, who is playing sports did have a punishment for it. It was also like slightly, I don't mean to like critique any of the teachers, but it was slightly unorganized in how 
they took account for the homework that you did. Like, it would have been a lot better if maybe they counted your homework every single night to see if you did it. Because sometimes, like, you'd have kids who would do their homework all the time, and the one time that the teacher would check would be the night that they forgot to write it on their agenda. And then their grade goes down to a 50. So it's unfortunate. I really think it reflected so much of the work and, like, effort students put in, but when the teachers happen to count. Well, I can, I can appreciate taking a pause on it if it's affecting um, certain areas negatively, and certainly I can appreciate there's a lot of other things to focus on right now that take precedence. Um, I, I, do, I did like the, the theory behind Habits of Work and, and hope that it can continue down the line in a more, you know, in a more useful way. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for <laughs> seeing us through all this. <laughs> Wait, there's Elizabeth. <laughs> well, there's this is yeah. a second room. Okay. So, just almost done, but for item 11, may I have a motion? I move we approve the following. Is this it? Yeah, I move we approve the following policy as presented for second reading. There we go. JJCB immunization of students and communicable diseases. Second. Thank okay. you for finding that. <laughs> Any discussion? The board should be aware that the policy that um, came before us mm -hmm. in August, it, we, we need to follow state law. That's all this does. Okay. All those in favor? Okay, moving on next to 12 committee reports, heard from policy thoroughly. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Policy's hot, man. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Place to be. Yeah. Okay, uh, requests for future school board meeting items. Uh, upcoming meetings. I see that we have policy. Uh, next one is on September 24th at 3 o'clock, central office. We have our school board retreat um, on September 25th at 12, from 12 to 3 at SMCC. And then later on, we will have a workshop that evening at 6.30 at the library. And uh, our last special business meeting, I mentioned that the town comprehensive public forum uh, they just changed the date. So the new date for you guys all to have is October 30th, um, which will be here at 6. Okay. October 30th at 6. Yeah. October 30th at 6. Yeah. Um, I would like student to. Student council would, would be most welcome, and, and you're all students. So. If Erin is listening or watching or ever gets word, Thank her for listing out the known upcoming meetings. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yep. And we appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. It's nice. And um, do we have a topic for the September workshop? Gosh, I can't remember. No, but we're meeting tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, just so mm -hmm. curious. So no, we'll we, have we don't. We're meeting tomorrow, but our hope is that one of the reasons we wanted to have the retreat as soon as we could possibly schedule it is to plan out the rest of our workshops for the year. So, so when's the joint meeting? With it is this Thursday at okay. nine. It's not on here. That's the other upcoming. Well, it, that, that was a, like a small committee. Um, right. I guess that's probably why it's not on there. But I can tell you more about it, John. Yeah. All right. Item fifteen. May I have a motion? I move we adjourn. Great. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in, oh, you have a discussion? No, okay, all those in favor. <laughs> I'm ready to vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.